Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to just feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'm out here at the location where we're going to be filming a short rapture film uh, beginning next Saturday. I mentioned this in my previous video. I believe it is absolutely important that we recognize that we've had eight chapters, uh, I'm sorry, 11 chapters of doctrine, of serious doctrinal truths. And when we come uh, to, or when we came to the 14th chapter, I suggested that we were looking at personal convictions. And probably the better thought is that we are looking at individual scruples as distinguished from that which is obvious sin clearly sin and in no way would I want to make light of sin there is sin and God has clearly given us a standard in his word so there are things that are clearly sin and that and that's not what we're talking about in Romans chapter 14 it's a sin to commit adultery it's a sin to lie it's a, a sin to, to steal it's, it's is it a sin to believe that only the King James Version is the correct translation of the scripture or is it a sin not to believe that? You know, I've had people unsubscribe from our channel uh, over a period of time. Uh, on occasion, they'll unsubscribe over that. They, they heard me read from the King James Version the first time that they showed up on the channel, and, and they were just ecstatic. You know, here's a ministry that believes that the King James Version is the one that Paul used and that it's the only good translation of the Bible. And then sometimes later, uh, I'll read from the NAS or the NIV or, or some other translation. I don't know what, what, and, and I'll get an email. Well, we don't like it when people read from anything other than the King James, because we know that you think that the James, the King James is the only good translation. And to which I say, well, I don't think that. You know, I think probably if I had my choice, it'd be the 1901 edition to the American Standard, although I don't like it that much either. But I like it better than the King James. And, and they'll say, well, why do you use the King James? And I say, well, because I've memorized much of it, and I'm too lazy to memorize another translation. And they unsubscribe from the channel. Now, is that sin? Or is that not sin? Now, that's exactly what we're dealing with in Romans 14. I, 
I didn't care that they thought that the King James Version was the only correct translation. It didn't bother me a bit. But apparently what I believed bothered them a lot. It doesn't bother me a bit if you go water skiing on Sunday, but it might bother somebody else a great deal. And that's what we've been looking at. That's what we looked at in our last video. At verse 7, none of us lives to himself and no man dies to himself. The word none there in the text is saying no one who is a believer in Christ. We're not looking at everybody. We're looking at God's family. We're looking at members of the body of Christ. Not one single one of them lives to himself and not one single one of them dies to himself. Just think about it for a moment. If we live to each other, we'd have a problem. You know, some don't fish on Sunday, some do, some smoke cigars, some don't, some drink, some don't, some wear lipstick, some don't. You know, how are we going to handle that? You know, we don't live to each other. We live to Christ. Whether we live, we live toward Christ. The word is toward there in the original text. Toward Christ, unto Christ, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. For whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to Him. We are His body, and our life is toward Christ, not toward each other. If we each have our eyes centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have time to, to put them on other people. And we wouldn't be so critical of those around us. And I don't want you to miss the comfort there in the fact that we belong to Him. You have no reason to think that you're not very important to Christ. You have no reason to reach that conclusion because you're important enough that he died in your place. It isn't that he died as much to do something for you. He actually died in your place. You are as precious to Christ as Christ is to God. You belong to the Lord, and since you're the Lord's, then there's an element of concern on how you use that which is his, and we're back again to presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. If it belongs to the Lord, how do you use it? How does the Lord want it used? This is what's leading up to the judgment seat of Christ here. It's one thing to use my own stuff, but when I borrow something from somebody else, I, I, use, I tend to use a little more care. I don't want to damage that which is not mine. And folks, my life is not mine. My body is not mine. So, uh, to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. He purchased us. That's what redemption is. That a price was paid. You were bought with a price, and you know what that price was. You didn't pay it. It wasn't your own. And that price was the blood of Jesus Christ. You are his for which he paid a great, great price. When I was a young man, that's been uh, several years ago, when I needed a hammer, I couldn't find one. So I went to a hardware store and I bought 12 of them. You know, because I figured any time I wanted a hammer, I was going to find it. So I spread them all over the place and within a week, I couldn't find a hammer. Several years later, I hired one of the neighborhood kids to, to sort of straighten up and clean up the tools and and, and he went around the shed and the house and the yard, and he came to me and he said, well, just how many hammers have you got? I couldn't find any, and he found a whole bunch of them. You see, I didn't much care. I didn't pay a whole lot for them. If I used a hammer, you know, I could just throw it down. If I couldn't find one, I'd just go to the store and buy another one because, well, you know, back then hammers were, you know, pretty cheap. They're not so cheap today, but they were back then, so I didn't care. But when I paid a great price for something, I was very cautious on, on how I used it. And I knew exactly where it was. God paid a great price for you. There's not a single one of you, not a single one of you who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, regardless of the life that you live, who isn't as precious to God as His Son is to Him. For this reason, so that He might own you, that you might be his, not Satan's or anybody else's or, or your own, that you might be his, he died. It's to that end that Christ died. He didn't die to clean up the world. He didn't die to establish nice nations. He died that you might be his. And much of professing Christianity today believes that that death is, well, just only the beginning of 
of something and and you know you'll be his if you decide to be or or you won't be if you don't decide to be you know as though there was something uh, as though there was really nothing uh, particular in that death but there was he died in your place folks individually every single one of you who are in Christ he actually died in your place so that you cannot die I have no idea what the the spread of our viewing audience looks like rich uh, poor smart dumb sinner not so much a sinner who knows all I know is you belong to Christ and the reason he died is that you might be his and he did not die in vain much of Christianity believes that a, a huge percentage of his death on the cross was wasted you know that he died for every single human being and every single human being is not redeemed therefore much of the price that he paid was simply a well a waste you know a priceless value that was thrown away but I declare unto you on the basis of God's Word that none of his sheep will be lost my sheep hear my voice I give unto all of them eternal life and they shall never perish and yet there are hordes of Christians today who believe that it is nothing short of heresy to, to declare that all of God's children go to heaven. I see Christian memes on Facebook all the time teaching that many of God's children are headed for hell. And so if we don't get out and stop it, well, many of God's children will wind up in hell, which is utter nonsense. This ministry stands for a particular redemption that everyone in whose place Christ died is redeemed and will spend eternity with Him in glory. That may not be your position, but it is mine. I believe that Christ died particularly for His own. Now, there's a multitude of Christians who have a problem with that. You know, here's a prostitute who says she's in Christ. And, you know, world religious system, they wouldn't believe that even though Rahab fits that case. When God says from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue, you, you might not like it, but you may be surprised to find out who winds up in, in glory. It's not based on human merit. It's not based on human work. It's not based on human production. The reason Christ died was to own those who are His. He bought them with a great price. That's the reason He died, and He rose again and revived we have two words that mean the same thing. Revive means he rose again and came back to life. I long for the day when I can stand before my Lord and not sin again. God himself became my kinsman in the flesh without ceasing to be God, and in that condition he was made sin. And the fact that the price paid is sufficient is the testimony of his resurrection. We saw that in the fourth chapter of this epistle. He was delivered because of our offenses, and he was raised again because we were made righteous, because we're justified. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Something absolutely amazing happened when Christ ascended up into heaven after his resurrection. He was justified in the Spirit. We have the word revived here in the text, and I believe absolutely it goes along with Timothy. He not only rose from the dead, but he was justified from the guilt of our sin. I can't tell you what all that means in the courts of glory, but I believe that we're looking at the most profound aspect of the death of Jesus Christ in our place. I know that God was satisfied with the infinite price that was paid, and that, that price was considered to be sufficient. And the one who was made sin in my place was revived, justified in the Spirit for that reason, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. You do not stand as a sinner before God. God never called you a sinner. It took me a long time to realize God never called me a sinner saved by grace. God calls me righteous. God calls me holy. God calls me unblameable. And when we look at our lives and we say eh, none of those things are true, we're really lying against the truth. You know, I'm not holy. I'm not righteous. I'm blameable. But God doesn't call us a sinner. God's grace calls me a son, calls me a saint. You can spend a lot of time in your own Bible study answering one question. Are you a sinner who is called a saint, or are you a saint who sins? And believe me, there's a huge difference. Since you don't have the time to do it, I'll answer the question for you. You're a saint who sins, and God calls you a saint. The reason Christ died is that we might be His. 
in that process and in our becoming his so that he owns us and we are no longer ours but his we don't own ourselves he owns us that process included his death his burial his resurrection and his justification in the spirit that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living folks look at the text dead and the living that is to say he was your Lord, even when you were dead in trespasses and sins. It doesn't say Lord of both the living and the dead, where dead follows the word living. And there are any number of Bible teachers who say the dead there are people who are not redeemed and who are not going to heaven. So the Lord is Lord of all, because you know every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess. However, in the present context, I think it's absolutely necessary that we connect the dead here with verse 8. Whether we die, that is, in Adam, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Therefore, he's Lord of both the dead and the living. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Paul was the Lord's before his Damascus Road experience. That is what I believe the text to be saying. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Verse 10, the word is crino, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the word Christ there in the original Greek is God, theos. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. And of course, there have been 10,000 sermons preached on this. The word for judgment seat there is not crino. Up in verse 10, why do you judge your brother? I mean, at the beginning of this verse, the word is crino, judgment, but the judgment seat is bema, and it's the raised platform upon which the judge sits. A great number of Christians believe that we're going to uh, stand there, and every sin that we've ever committed is going to be portrayed. You know, we're just going to watch a, a some rotten movie of every you know thing that we ever did. That is not the truth. That is not bema. And of course, the biblical question then has to be for what did Christ stand in judgment for? And we can go to a whole lot of scriptures. By thy words thou shalt be con condemned, and by thy words thou shalt be justified, in Matthew. Every foolish word shall be given account thereof in the day of judgment. We can take Luther's position, you know, that your sins will be accounted for before that judgment seat. Or we can look at what we were taught in the 8th chapter here in this study. There is therefore now no judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we can look in Corinthians that we will give an accounting of how we built on Christ. And I contend that that's where we are here. The we is not everyone, folks. The we is every Christian. This is not the great white throne judgment. You know, in the great white throne judgment, there, there won't be a single Christian standing there. Here, however, before this reward tribunal, there will be only those who are in Christ, and we are to give an account as we stand before that judgment seat. So for what are we going to give an account? And some of the greatest Bible teachers have, I think, have tripped in suggesting that here all of our sins are going to be portrayed and we're going to give an account for them. You know, why did you rob that bank? Why did you commit that murder? You know, imagine David. You know, I, I don't know whether Uriah is going to be there with a prosecuting attorney. I mean, you know, you can come up with all kinds of fanciful nonsense, and yet the Scriptures tell us that the Gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And when, and when no charge can be laid against you for sin, that charge was laid against Christ. Who shall lay any charge against God's elect? For it is He that, that justifies. It's Christ that died, and that's where we are. I don't believe that we're looking at an accounting for sins for which Christ paid, but there is the consideration of how you live your life. I don't know what God's ordained in your life, folks, but I believe the accounting that you're going to give is how you handled it. You know, you can go into Christian bookstore after bookstore, and you can go to, to minister after minister. You know, what do I have to do to be born again? 
Well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, where do you get that? I've, I've issued this challenge to my followers a number of times. Show me the verse. I challenge you to find one verse of Scripture that would support that. I'm born from above by the will of God, not by the will of Steve. Much is being built on wood, hay, and stubble. The so-called evangelical church today is in, is in terrible disarray. Gold, silver, precious stones is holding forth the truth of this book, folks. Built upon the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we build upon, and this is God's Word, and we cannot treat it lightly. It should be an inseparable part of your life. I'll talk more about the judgment seat of Christ as we go along. Until then, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.